footprint from the brink of disaster to the zen of the pacemaker. Thank you. So um, we're going to be doing this like two people, or really three people that we have here. Uh, my name is Florian. Um, this is Tim, and we also have Andrew Bikov from Rare Hat sitting in that third row over there. He happens to be the author, creator, and lead maintainer of Pacemaker. So um, if there's any, if we get any questions where we're out of our depth or stuff where, or situations where stuff just doesn't work as documented, we have the guy, we have a throat to choke. So um, that's quite useful. So, um, a little, a few words about, I, I guess we should say a few words about ourselves. Um, my name's Florian, you may have seen me in Brisbane last year, um, back then I used to work for Linbit. Um, since then I have co-founded Hestexo, which is an independent, um, high availability and distributed storage um, consultancy. Tim um, has also changed company affiliation nominally since Brisbane, because back then he used to work for Novell, and now he officially works for SUSE again. Um, and Andrew don't ask. was. Hmm, say again. Don't, he's shaking his head. Don't ask. <laughs> and um, Andrew used to work for Red Hat then, and is working for Red Hat now, but he wasn't in Brisbane. <laughs> right. Just to make it. Yeah, LCA last year. Okay. okay. All right. So um, we put up the uh, instructions for the tutorial on the tutorial wiki page. This is just the uh, the, the Google uh, short URL. Um, you are entirely free to follow along um, our steps as we go or just watch today and replicate the setup whenever you return from LCA and you do that um, in the comfort of your home or office or home office. Um, that's entirely up to you. I think you're going to take something very useful away from this tutorial no matter which path uh, you choose. A few words on uh, the organization of our slides. Uh, we're using two different um, slide layouts here, so just so you know exactly where we are in the talk. We have one layout which is like this, that's the one with the, uh, with the blue bar to the left, and it means would you please treat us to the courtesy of your kind attention, uh, is a line that I stole from a BMI pilot, which he did when they launched the security ballet on a flight. And I thought it was kind of a nice, you know, British way of saying, you know, shut up and listen. Um, you don't have to shut up, actually. Um, listening is fine. Um, and of course, if there's any questions that you have throughout the talk, then please fire them at us um, immediately. Uh, we have a bit of a shortage of mics here because uh, Tim has the lapel, lapel mic because he's, he's going to be doing much of the typing. So we only have this one handheld. Um, so just so everything gets picked up in the recording, when you have a question, please put up your hand. I'll be sprinting toward you, uh, trying not to trip, and put the microphone in your hand. And then uh, we can uh, take the question and um, tackle it immediately. And then we have a slightly different layout, which is the one with the horizontal bar. And that's do something, right? Um, so we're, uh, we're having these, uh, these little instruction bits and pieces uh, where you actually get to do stuff on your cluster. Uh, all of you have access to a virtual environment uh, which we made available to you prior to the talk. And Rob Thomas was nice enough to actually set up a mirror for the uh, VMDK images. So uh, not everyone has to download from Dropbox what these are. Uh, it's basically a virtual two-node cluster uh, of two Debian machines, Debian squeeze, squeeze machines. Of course, we know OpenSUSE is wonderful and Fedora is wonderful as well. And you can run Pacemaker on all of these platforms and on Slays and on RHEL and on CentOS and on what have you. Um, it's just that we had to select one and we selected Debian. That's it. Um, so these are two boxes. Um, they're named Alice and Bob. Um, they, have, uh, they both have two uh, virtual network interfaces, uh, of which we're going to use both for cluster communications. One is the, sort of the connection to the sort of public switch network, uh, which is the one that your clients would be connecting to. And the other is the one that we're using for uh, storage replication with DOBD. And we're going to use uh, them both for cluster communications. Um, and the 
these, uh, these virtual machines both have two uh, virtual block devices. One is where the OS is installed and the other is the one that we're using as our data volume and that we're going to replicate with DRBD. Um, you will be able to uh, shell into these boxes if you have them properly set up. The IP addresses would be uh, 192, 168, 122, 111, and 112. 111 is Alice, 112 is Bob. You can shell in as root. The um, password is Hastexo, H-A-S-T-E-X-O. Sorry for the shameless self-plug. And um, you're, of course, free to put your own secure shell public key into the .ssh authorized keys or authorized keys to file. Uh, in order for you to have passwordless login on these uh, on these machines. So that's about it for the virtual environment. As I said, not a requirement for you to set it up, but if you want to follow along, then that would be helpful to have. If you don't want to follow along now, you can set up the virtual environment at any time. They're going to be in uh, that Dropbox account for quite a while. I would, es I would estimate at least one month past LCA. So that gives you plenty of time to download them and uh, run them, because we're not supposed to say deploy anymore, um, and run them in your, in your own virtual environment. Um, all that's required is essentially is libvirt and either QMU or KVM. Um, and uh, we also have um, uh, VMware images and VMX files, although there's clearly no warranty on those, so there might be um, a little hacking and fixing that you need to do to get those running. Most of the time, uh, they work fine. Uh, if they don't, please talk to your VMware experts and go. Avi had a question. Does the VMware images be fine on Okay, so Avi is saying the VMware images boot fine and we're happy with that. Awesome. So in other words, if you're failing at it, go talk to Avi and he's going to help <laughs> you with them. <laughs> Okay. Do we have another question over here? Yes? Uh, VMware Workstation works fine as well. You might need to adjust the interfaces that are pointed to that. Awesome. So VMware Workstation works fine as well. The only uh, platform that I've actually heard people report problems with are some versions of VMware Player. So Workstation and Server and actually also importing stuff into ESX should work fine. And evidently VirtualBox is working fine as well. Uh, you might have some issues with uh, VMware Player. Okay, so a very, very brief overview of the Linux high availability stack. First off the bat, um, we've, we have quite a number of familiar faces in here of whom I know that they're very familiar with the Pacemaker and Linux HA stack. Can I just have a quick show of hands on who has deployed this stuff in production before? Okay. Okay, quite a few. Um, so, um, just out of curiosity, who's using uh, what used to be called Red Hat Cluster Suite and which now has the much more concise product name of Red Hat Enterprise Linux High Availability Add-on? <laughs> who's, using, who's using Red Hat Cluster? No one? Okay. Uh, Clusterware? Yes, there's one. Okay. Anybody using the similarly named SUSE Linux Enterprise High? Oh yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <there's laughs> but it's actually not SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. It's just SUSE Linux Enterprise High Availability Extension, right? Yes. yes. Okay. So that's. But you are. So are it's not for servers. Say again. So it's not for servers. <laughs> it's, no, it is. It's it's for anything. You know, it's like. It's probably there's probably a SUSE Linux Enterprise smartphone. High availability, whatever. Uh, we, we, can, we can't talk about that yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, how does this? What what does the stack um, look like? What is it that we uh, use in order to make uh, applications highly available? Uh, basically, I, I always go through this from from uh, bottom to top, and I'm seeing that we we don't ex actually have still a contrast on um, that display here. Sorry about that, but I'll go through it anyhow. Um, so at the bottom of the stack, we typically or very often have some uh, form of storage replication. Not necessarily. We can also do clusters with single Im image storage, but that basically means that you're intro introducing um, a spoof into your design from the get-go because you have this one single um, data silo. Uh, that if that basically uh, turns to shreds, 
then all of your other HA comes to naught because you don't have any data to serve anymore, which, is kind of, which kind of defeats the purpose. So very often we have a storage replication. There's multiple ways of achieving this. Uh, there's proprietary solutions like uh, you may be familiar with um, uh, with IBM Metro Mirror, or there's NetApp Metro Cluster, there's EMC SRDF. Uh, and we have a number of, thankfully, we have a number of open source solutions. Uh, DRBD is a, uh, is a block level uh, replication service, which incidentally is also going to be the one that we're using in our setup here. Uh, but there are uh, file system based uh, replication uh, functionality that you can use, uh, such as Gluster, and there's a few others. So most of the time we have some form of, oh, and by the way, uh, we could also be using some uh, application specific data replication, such as a MySQL replication or, um, or, or Postgres streaming replication or anything of that nature. It doesn't necessarily have to be application agnostic the way uh, DOBD is. So that's sort of the bottom of the stack. The next thing is we've got a cluster messaging layer. So that's a reliable message passing uh, layer that we use to for nodes basically to communicate. And it's not just that, it's not just reliable message delivery, but it's also things like establishing the cluster membership, as in what nodes are currently uh, members in, of the cluster and behaving well. Um, and we also have the establishment of cluster quorum at that layer. On top of that, we have cluster resource management. And Contrary to what Karen was complaining about in the keynote, now we have a pacemaker that actually does run open source. It's kind of nice. Um, so, uh, so this is the stuff that basically keeps our, our, uh, our, our cluster resources going. We don't really have a formal definition of what a cluster resource is, other than if the cluster manages it, it's a resource. Um, and that can be something like very, very simple, like um, a, a, a floating IP address that moves between cluster nodes. Uh, it can be a file system that we, um, that we mount um, as we need it on individual cluster nodes. And it can be something reasonably complex, like um, a database, right? Like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle. We can um, keep all of that under, under Pacemaker or under under the uh, auspices of a, of a cluster resource manager, and Pacemaker is the one that we're going to be using. Like I said earlier, there's others um, in the Red Hat cluster stack that would be RG Manager. Um, Avi will probably be able to tell us what the equivalent in Oracle Clusterware is. It's all Clusterware. It's all Clusterware, OK. So it's this big monolith Borg collective Death Star thing. Um, and, uh, and that's the kind of stuff that keeps not only starts and stops resources, but also monitors them, keeps them alive. Uh, when there's bad things happening on uh, one of our nodes, but we still have healthy nodes that we can still use, this is what affects our, um, our cluster resource failover. And this is the kind of stuff that generally keeps us happy. And it keeps us happy because it interfaces with what we actually really care about, and that is the application that we want to keep highly available. And we currently have what is it? We, I think we have about 70 resource agents that ship either with Pacemaker or with some third parties um, that we can thereby make highly available. Like I said, from a simple IP address over a file system, um, databases, whole virtual machines, um, messaging uh, servers, yada, yada, yada. So we have a pretty long list there. And uh, what we're going to be using in our example configuration today is uh, the application that we're going to make highly available is MySQL. Why? Reasonably arbitrary. Um, we could have chosen any of the other uh, 70 uh, resource types that we can manage. Why do we use MySQL? Simply because it's um, a service that pretty much everyone who's ever done any system in work on Linux will have touched sometime in their career. So we can estimate that um, people are probably going to be familiar with it. Anyone not know what MySQL is? <laughs> okay? Okay. They're, good. They're, they're too embarrassed. Huh? They're too embarrassed. Yeah, they're probably. <laughs> they probably are. Okay. That's a, it's a mouse or something. <laughs> <laughs> Can be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any? Uh, beer. Uh, okay. <laughs> that works. Um, okay. Um, ah. Well, yeah, nice. That, 
Yeah, the, 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 the contrast really like, sucks. Is there a whiteboard marker? Is there what? Whiteboard marker. Uh, there is a whiteboard marker, but then we're... Well, no, I can scribble a picture on the side. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank technology. Um, one would have assumed that in 2012 this is a problem that would be solved. Uh, now, let me walk you through this. And just so I feel your pain, I'm going to walk up here just to see how bad this really is. Wow. OK, note to self, uh, black arrows next time. Um, hmm. OK, so what we have here is we've got basically two uh, physical hosts that are running um, our uh, cluster services, uh, DOBD storage, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, those, yes, thank you. <laughs> Could you cartwheel? <laughs> um, and one of these is always um, basically the active node from the, from the cluster perspective, and it acts as our MySQL master node. Okay? And then down here, we have a number of um, either MySQL slaves or downstream application servers that just use this uh, MySQL master node. And then, of course, you know, the configuration or the topology can become arbitrarily complex. Um, What's nice about this is now um, that we've got this, all of this running on one node, we can then simply fail over that MySQL master to the other node. That's a very simple command, one command that we do in the, um, in the pacemaker shell, and everything moves over. And what's nice is because DUBD makes sure that um, this service sees exactly the same kind of uh, data on both of these nodes, and we have a virtual IP address, a floating IP address that this MySQL master node uh, binds to. I'm sorry, the MySQL master service binds to. Uh, beyond this failover, there's literally nothing else that we need to do. It's a completely transparent kind of failover. Um, the slaves and the downstream app servers will just uh, continue to talk to the same IP address, which now, by magic, just lives on a different node, uh, which we don't need to care about because we make sure that everything is exactly identical on that node. So let's start first with DRBD, and this is where we actually get into, you know, practically working on these boxes. Um, in all of these title slides for the technologies that we're covering, there's two links in there. One is a, a, a very quick, it's like a one-page write-up that we happen to put on our company website, uh, which is just a very, very quick rundown, sort of the elevator speech for all of these technologies. It's just one screenful. And then uh, the... Um, uh, the URL on the bottom is the official project website. So DRBD is a storage replication technology um, that allows us to replicate data at the block level. It's that simple. Um, and we can use DRBD in any way, shape, or form that we normally would use any other block device. What's nice about DRBD is that all of the data that goes into it is being synchronously re replicated over to another node. That is to say that whenever we write something to this device, um, that write does not complete until it's actually completed on both nodes. And because all of this happens at the, at the block layer, that is to say like relatively low down in the, um, in the, in the Linux I.O. stack, all of this is remarkably efficient and comes with really, really impressive performance. So there's a very, very, very little overhead uh, for, um, for using DRBD. And now... Tim will assume his position here, and we're going to just do a quick switcher over. Um, so what we're going to start with is we're going to uh, set up, what's this noise? Oh, gone now. Okay. Um, is, what we're going to, and by the way, OpenSUSE is great too, in case I forgot to, ask, I forgot to mention that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a DOBD resource which we're then going to use as a file system, and that file system is going to be used as the MySQL data dir, the stuff that we mount to violate MySQL. We just make sure that this stuff is now on replicated storage. Now, in order to set this up, you're going to have to uh, log into both of your boxes. Do we still, did a whiteboard marker eventually turn up? Lovely. Thank you. So, um, and that is a whiteboard marker, yes. It's like the most embarrassing thing that you can ever do at doing a talk when you're taking a Sharpie and writing on a whiteboard. Um, so, 192, 168, 122, 111, 
that's Alice, and 112, that's Bob. Those are the machines that you now need to shell into. And those will be running in a virtual bridge. And uh, luckily, Tim already has that set up and connected, and everything is wonderful. So there is a central configuration file to DRBD. Um, happily, it lives in slash etsy slash drbd.conf. And that is really just a skeleton that includes anything that's in um, etsy drbd.d. So that's like um, you know, a few defaults and yada, yada, yada. Not really particularly interesting to us at this point. This is basically as it ships. But what we want to take a look at is the mysql.res configuration. OK? Can so every, can everybody see that? I can make that bigger if you need me to. And look, we've got good contrast. It's just black on white. <laughs> um, so uh, a DVD resource definition is actually very, very simple. We need to assign a unique resource. And, and, and by the way, you find all of these um, in your configs as well. So just go in uh, cd into slash etsy slash dobd.d and you will find that in there as well. So uh, it's very simple. We've got the resource uh, MySQL. We, we just uh, need to set and, and basically an arbitrary uh, resource name. It can be, I think it can be any name uh, with up to, I think up to 64 characters. It has to be US ASCII and it shouldn't contain white space if I remember correctly. Um, we then define, OK, what's the DOBD device that we're going to be managing with this? In this case, it's just going to be dev DOBD 0. In case you're interested, all DOBD devices have the Lanana registered uh, device major number 147. Um, and then it's DOBD 0 is the minor 0 and so forth. Um, and we also need to define, OK, what is my actual lo local backing storage that I want to replicate? That in this case would be the dev SDB1 partition. And this metadisk thing is where DOBD stores its own DOBD specific metadata. So DOBD itself needs to uh, store a little bit of persistent metadata on this backing device. Um, in case you're wondering how much that is, it is about 32K per gig of replicated storage. Okay. Um, and then we simply define, OK, we've got these two nodes, um, which have to be identified by name here. And you uh, identify them by name uh, just as the uname-n output for those nodes. Why am I mentioning that? On Debian and SUSE and a number of other platforms, that is just the unqualified host name, as we're seeing here. That would be Alice and Bob. Um, if you're running this on Fedora or CentOS or RHEL, then uname-n is actually, uh, by default, the fully qualified domain name, in which case you would put the fully qualified domain name here. We're telling it uh, to replicate, in this case, over a separate dedicated network. So the 133 uh, class C subnet is mapped to the F1 interface. And that's the one that we're going to be using to replicate. By convention, although this is not registered anywhere, by convention, DUBD uses replication ports from 7788 forward. And you need to have a uniquely identifiable socket, replication socket, for all of your DUBD resources. That is to say, you either reuse the IP address and then put um, different ports, or you just um, use multiple IP addresses with the same port. The former option is the much more common one. So what we're telling DUBD here is, when you're configured, you're going to be managing the device dev DRBD0. Um, its backing device is going to be um, SDB1. So that's the data set that you're going to replicate. You're going to set aside a little bit of space at the end of that device for DRBD metadata. And you're going to be replicating over these addresses on port uh, 7788. Um, that configuration needs to be identical on both cluster nodes, and that is exactly what's already the case for your, um, for your virtual machines. Now, what we need to do is we actually need to fire this thing up. And before we do that, we at first should check whether we actually have that SDB1 partition that we want to replicate over. And it turns out that we don't. Okay, so let's create it. Uh, you can create that using whatever tool of your choice. On Debian, I tend to like to uh, use CFDisk, but you can use FDisk or whatever it is that you prefer. So 
So we're going to partition def stb1 and on this we're going to create a one primary partition, one gig in size. We want to make the primary exactly and then one right and then that we pl I think that's plus one gig actually mm -hmm. in, in regular yeah, yeah. disk. Plus one GB in capital. Mm -hmm. There you go, and then whoops, and uh, yeah, and then W for right. Okay, and that's it. Okay, and now it's here, and now we can you know use our one-liner scripting ninja by doing an sfdisk dash d dev sdb and pipe that to ssh bob sfdisk dash dash force. There we go. Uh, oops, sorry, no, 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 kill that. You have to give that another def sdb at the end. That would be a good idea. Yeah, def sdb. There we go. <coughs> and, say again? DNS no, time. it's not DNS, it's uh, if, uh, the, it's actually GSS API that for some reason is enabled in Debian secure shell config or whatnot. Yeah, I think the resolve comp is wrong. Hmm? I think the resolve comp is wrong. I had to change it on my system. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But uh, that's actually in Etsy hosts, so it actually shouldn't be looking up anything, but oh well. So there we go. Okay? The good um, Ah, yes. Have we mentioned that the IPv6 UX on Linux sucks and someone needs to fix that? Um, that may not be entirely new to you. Um, so, uh, what we've created is an SDB1 partition uh, on, uh, on both of these, on the SDB device on both of these nodes. So, we now have everything in place in terms of prerequisites uh, that um, we need to set up our DVD resource. Now, since I already mentioned, DOBD uses um, a certain amount of internal persistent on-disk metadata for its own uh, purposes, and it doesn't just pull that metadata out of clean air. We have to create it. We have to create it once on both of the nodes, only once in the lifetime of a DOBD resource. And that's what we do with the DOBD Atom create-md command. By the way, you're, uh, you are complete. Oh, and we have oh. bash completion for that thing as well. So it's just give it the atom, tap, and then you get an. Do I need a mod probe here first? Hmm? Do I need a mod probe nope. here first? No. Uh, excellent question. Um, the metadata um, creation is something that happens entirely in user space, and we don't even have to mod probe the DVD module for that. Um, so DVD atom create MD, and then the resource name. That will be my SQL. There we go. And this is not exactly spectacular because what it does here is it just creates it and everything is fine. But there's actually a significant amount of intelligence built into this command. It will actually take a look whether there is data currently on this device. And if it, say, detects an ext3 or XFS or even riser uh, file system signature, it will then check, okay, is this command still keeping enough um, does that, do we still have enough room for the, on the device in order to create the metadata? And if not, rather than silently wrecking your file system, it's going to tell you. And it's going to tell you, OK, uh, I don't have enough space on this device. Um, I would be overriding the tail end of a file system. I'm not going to do that. Please either resize the file system, as in shrink it, or resize the underlying block device, as in enlarge it, which is something that is easily done with, for example, LVM. Um, and it also detects things like LVM, physical volume signatures, and things like that. So it's reasonably intelligent. Right now, all of that intelligence is basically wasted because we have empty devices to begin with. So we just create this metadata block, and we're happy. Um, and we do the same thing on the other node. That answers yesterday's uh, file system talk when the XFS guy was, was saying, why would you ever want to shrink a file yeah, that's system? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a good use case, yeah. So we now have a set of metadata um, for both of these uh, on, on both of these nodes. Um, the metadata is always when we use MetaDisk internal. Um, it's always at the very end of the device. That is to say, if you ever choose to kick DRBD out, then you can just mount the underlying 
uh, backing device. And it will just detect the file system superblock on that and everything will be fine. So there's no additional modifications that DOBD makes to that underlying device other than putting a little bit of data at its very end. So uh, we can now bring this device up and this is where we need to mod probe. By the way, um, mod probing DOBD is of course not something that you always need to do manually. That is something that the cluster manager will happily do for you as we shall soon see. So we mod probe this thing and I suppose you did that on both nodes. Yep. Lovely. Um, and then we're using the DOBD atom up command to bring this thing up. No, not Maestro Res, just the resource name. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Uh, just a second. We do that on the other node as well, and I'll be happy to take the question. No, this is a typo in your walkthrough. Oh. It says DRBD admin up DRBD instead of MyC. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I will fix that. Uh, so it's D it's it's DOBD atom, which is the which is the binary, and then up, which is the subcommand for that binary, and then goes the resource name. Or alternatively, you can also do a DOBD atom up all, in which case it will just up all of the resources. So you can't name your resource all. You shouldn't really. <laughs> <laughs> you also should not name your resources master or slave. <laughs> Or active or backup, you should also not do that with your nodes. I'm just, I'm just about to push it, push it into yes, the because it's going to be real fun when you're when it's 3 a.m. on January 1st and you're terribly hungover and your phone goes off and you need to fix a system where you now have DRBD in the secondary role on a master node named Slave. Good luck with that. <laughs> Specifically when you're trying to explain that to your coworker on the phone who's still sober. Um, <laughs> So now, um, it's up and we can now interrogate the status of this DOBD resource by just looking at the proc DOBD virtual file, which is what almost did, uh, which almost uh, stopped DOBD from ever getting merged because Christoph Helvig was freaking out about something, doing something new in proc. Um, but it's good now, I guess. Um, and this is the expected state uh, that we get out of a freshly initialized DOBD device. Um, it is connected, that is to say that the two nodes are happily talking to each other. Um, it is currently in the secondary role, so what do we mean by that? We have two roles in any DOBD device, primary, secondary. Um, with the primary, we can basically do anything. We can read from it, we can write to it, we can do whatever the hell we want. Um, on a secondary, it's just there and it receives updates from um, the other side. A uh, question that we get relatively often is why does it not let me mount this thing read only? The secondary, that is, um, if you're wondering out about that, please Google for cache coherency and uh, you'll find out. Um, it's just not a good thing to have a file system that is mounted read only with something else modifying the underlying block device. It's just not going to work. Okay, and our disk state here is inconsistent, inconsistent. What does that mean? Uh, the poor thing does not yet know what its good data is. Okay, um, we can always add a DOBD resource after the fact to, um, uh, to, to a backing device that already has data, in which case we have to tell DOBD, okay, sync from here to there. Because you've got all your precious data here and now you're, you're adding DOBD and you've got a blank disk on the node over here that you want to become, you know, your second mirror. And now if you told DRBD, oh, by the way, this over here is the good data, then you would be overriding all your precious data with blanks. And that's not what you want. So uh, in this case, however, um, we don't give a flip because the uh, storage has been completely freshly initialized. So we have a facility to actually skip this initial sync for which we have an extraordinarily useful and terribly usable command, um, which I will now spell out, which is dripped atom. By the way, you're welcome to pronounce it dripped because that's just shorter. And, um, and in that case, by the way, linguistically, the R becomes a vowel because a vowel is defined as any sound that can bear the stress of a syllable. So in that case, dripped R vowel. Um, I digress. So that would be DOBD atom. <laughs> dash dash space dash dash clear dash bitmap space new dash current dash UUID and then resource name. 
Great. There you go. Isn't, isn't that lovely? You know, we could we could have a I you were we, we could have a yeah. DOBD atom, you know, force, skip sync, whatnot. But this is how it works. Okay. Um, you don't have to worry at this point what a UUID is, how DOBD uses them internally. It's very very interesting if you're interested in that. Um, but we're just rotating our UUIDs at this point, and we're also clearing the quick sync bitmap just for background. Okay. Um, and now that we have that, we can take a look at ProcDOBD again. And lo and behold, everything is up to date. Okay? So Fast, DOBD fastest sync in the world. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we actually have a virtual um, super in express infinity duper band uh, <laughs> between these. Um, and it will actually sync faster than the speed of light. Um, if you saw any Cherenkov radiation here, that's what it was. Um, <laughs> So everything is now fine, up to date, up to date, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, we can now also make the device primary on any node that we please, but just on one, because it's a single primary device. So that would be a DBD atom or dripped atom primary MySQL, at which point it is now primary. And now we can do anything that we freaking please with this device. Um, in our case, what we're going to create is a file system. Um, because that's what we're going to use as our, um, we're just going to use it as, as regular MySQL data storage. So what we're going to do ext3, because we're boring, and we put that on the dev db0, and arguably in this virtual environment, that's going to be slow because makefs and fs check on ext3 are slow, and um, our replication network here is slow, and our virtual disks are slow, and everything else. But that's okay because Dave Tuna's not here. That's, yeah. And um, I think Debian doesn't yet ship with Butter. Sorry, Avi. So, um. Yeah, uh, Butterface is useless for MySQL. I mean, what? OK. If I, if, if I were Chennai, I'd say, OK, what's this useful for? But, eh, nah, nah, I'm not. <laughs> Let's not go there. Dave and I have decided that Butterface for root makes a face for MySQL there. OK. All right. Um, so while this is uh, while this is chugging along, um, this is of course also something that you only need to do once. So if you've initialized the DOBD resource, you're creating a file system on it, and eventually what we're going to do is we're going to initialize a, a MySQL database on this thing. Okay? So let's let that do its thing for now, and let's focus on something slightly different. Can you pull up the chorusing slide? That's the OBD, and we've done, we've done that, mm -hmm. and here's Chorusync, okay? Again, brief write-up on our website, and if you're interested in all the gory details, go to www.chorusync.org, where you are, are you gonna find any documentation? You might find an FAQ. <laughs> um, um, Chorusync is um, a uh, messaging layer. Uh, it implements the, the Totem protocol. There's a lot of research papers on Totem, which you're gonna love. Um, and um, it's uh, developed by a uh, development team uh, headed by Steve Dake, or as he likes to be called, Stake, uh, from uh, Red Hat. Uh, it grew out of the OpenAIS project, which was an attempt to implement a design by committee um, specification for um, uh, an application interface specification for highly available services. Um, Let's not go into history too much because it's painful. Um, what uh, Chorusync ultimately does is al it allows our cluster nodes to communicate and pass cluster messages, um, establish membership, and establish quorum. It has um, two configuration files of relevance. Both are in, no, actually three. Uh, both are in slash etsy slash Chorusync or subdirect subdirectories thereof. In your slash etsy slash Chorusync, you are going to find a chorusync.conf, and uh, we're going to pull that up real quick uh, just to go through that. That is also available on both of your nodes. Uh, nothing too spectacular here either, except for one thing. Chorusync is, of course, capable of doing redundant communications across multiple uh, cluster links, cluster communication links. And so we're defining these two rings here. And uh, we are using what Chorusync calls the redundant ring protocol. Um, in other words, a means of failing over between rings. We're going to use the active uh, uh, RP mode here. And uh, we are communicating 
over a UDP multicast. In this case, we define a multicast group, one multicast group per ring. Uh, in case, so, and we highly recommend that you use RFC 2365 uh, compliant multicast addresses. That defines administratively scoped multicast, which basically specifies you something in the 239.255.x.x pseudo subnets, which is why we're doing here. Uh, just in case uh, you're also the guy who operates the firewalls at your shop, um, it actually uses that multicast port for UDP communications and that port minus one. So it will actually communicate over UDP ports 55, uh, 5405 and 5404. Okay, that's just, don't ask why. Well, you can ask why because it's basically two-way communications. Uh, that's just the way it is. Um, and uh, we also use sec auth equals on, which means that we are um, using multi, um, mutual node, node authentication with um, cryptographic hashes. And for that, we have another file in that same directory called auth key. And that can be basically any 128 byte arbitrary secret. So um, I just generate them out of def u random, um, but you can also... There's a, there's a chorus in keygen. Yeah, there's a chorus in keygen which actually reads from def random and will therefore block if we don't have cryptographically secure entropy on the device, uh, uh, on the node um, at the time. Havged, or however you pronounce it, H-A-V-E-G-E-D daemon is a um, entropy gathering daemon that yeah. Useful. Yeah. In that case, it's, however, totally useless to actually have, like, some, well, anyhow. Yeah. Um, uh, but you can also use, you know, feed face dead beef um, repeated a few times uh, <laughs> if, if that's your preferred secret. Um, so uh, these config files also have to be identical on both nodes, uh, which is the case for you at this point. And uh, what we can now do is we just uh, start the uh, Chorusync daemon. Uh, on a Debian box that is either slash itc slash init.d slash chorusync start or it's service chorusync start, same thing. We do that on both nodes. Okay, anyone uh, worked with pacemaker 1.0 as opposed to 1.1? Okay, in the pacemaker 1.0 series, uh, the pacemaker demons themselves would be children of the chorusync process. Um, in, and that meant that you didn't have to do anything other than start chorusync and it would start pacemaker as, or several pacemaker related demons as its children. Um, in pacemaker 1.1 1, 1, we have the ability to use what we call the pacemaker master control process and um, that comes with a separate daemon, pacemaker D. Uh, we have a much more lightweight Corsync uh, pacemaker integration, and we also don't have, I think it was threading issues that prompted you to actually do that. Uh, yeah, deadlocks uh, related to forking from a threaded process. Yeah, okay, so for the recording, that's deadlocks related to forking from a threaded process. Um, and uh, with the new uh, pacemaker MCP, we don't have that problem anymore. Um, we uh, configure Chorusync to use this new method of pacemaker integration by uh, uh, the Chorusync uh, service.d pacemaker service definition file. That's right here, yes. And uh, if the service is just pacemaker, the service name, and if we use version one, that means that we're configuring the, the you know, Chorusync part of the infrastructure to use the pacemaker MCP. If you use version zero, then and uh, all the pacemaker stuff gets loaded as chorusync plugins and thus as chorusync children. And plugins are going away anyhow, aren't they? Yeah, so that's not going to be supported for that much longer. You definitely want to be using the uh, version 1 thingy. Uh, except if, you know, well, no. Except if you're running SUSE. Yeah, we we never yeah. had that problem on SUSE. I don't know why. <laughs> and it's just awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, it'll remain supported in... If you're using Chorusync 1.4 or less, um, it will still be supported. We're not going to remove it from Pacemaker. But if you're running against Chorusync 2.0 plus, then it goes all goes away. Um, to that, I'd like to add um, using Chorusync 1.4.0 plus is a really, really good idea because prior to that, it didn't have ring recovery. So rings would not automatically recover if they broke and then got reestablished. And in Chorusync 1.4, we finally have that functionality, so please use Chorusync 1.4 by all means. Um, until Chorusync 2.0 comes out and the bugs have been stamped out. Um, 
So uh, that's that. Um, as you will be able to see from a simple PS at this point, we only have the chorusing process running. And uh, where's our chorusing? It's a good question. Uh, up there. Up there. Yeah. OK? It's just chorusing. Um, there are no uh, pacemaker-related daemons running at this point. But we can already interrogate what chorusing knows about the cluster state at this point. First, we're going to figure out, OK, are our rings healthy? In other words, are, are we communicating nicely on the network? We have chorusing CFG tool with the dash lowercase s flag for that purpose. And it's going to tell you what is our current ring status. Um, you should, when we've got a healthily communicating cluster, we would always see um, the status ring 0 and 1 active with no faults. And uh, that's fine that way. OK. Um, um, question in the front. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the what's the uh, significance of that version number in the service thing again? You had version one there. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, if you're using version zero, uh -huh. then you using the old style method of uh, all the pacemaker demons being chorusing children. Yeah. Uh, which means that you don't need to start any pacemaker demons separately. Okay. But you're running into the locking issues that Andrew mentioned, or you might potentially yeah, run into the locking issues. Um, it's been supported since Pacemaker 113, I think, right? When, when did MCP come in? 112, 113, something like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was one, one, yeah, I'm not sure. But it's definitely, 113 one, plus definitely does support it. I, I might have come in in 112, but. It's like a year. Okay. Yeah. Took that two years. Yeah, uh, the, the current Pacemaker version, by the way, is 116, and most distros ship that. So, or current incarnations of most distros ship that. Um, Relying on this too much, there is a bit of a caveat, which is um, if Chorusync starts up and it never sees its peer, um, it basically forms a one node cluster in which all rings are healthy, um, uh, uh, which is logical, but which sim simply means that you shouldn't rely on the Chorusync CFG tool output alone. But we can also interrogate the Chorusync object database, which we do with Chorusync OBJCTL. Um, and we grep for member in that one, member or members. There we go. And uh, you should be seeing both of your cluster members here in that output. OK? Um, so in that case, uh, we're seeing uh, these, these two nodes. Uh, it actually, uh, Corsic really doesn't care about your node names at all. Um, but it will give you the um, interfaces that it is uh, communicating over. And both of them should, of course, have the status equals joined. Okay? So now we have, what we already have is a working chorusing cluster. So uh, as far as chorusing is concerned, everything is already operating normally. And now the only thing that we still have to do before we can actually start adding resources to everything is to start the pacemaker services. And um, in the pacemaker MCP configuration, uh, we uh, pacemaker comes with a separate daemon, um, and that's pacemaker D, which is what we're going to start next after I take this question. Um, can you explain the relationship between Corosync and a thing called Heartbeat? Uh, uh, yeah, that's easy. Uh, there is none. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, f for, for, for those of you who uh, never touched Linux clustering until about two years ago, um, the Linux HA project, linuxha.org, has an over 10 year long um, history. Um, it came uh, with both a cluster messaging layer, which is called Heartbeat, and uh, it came with a cluster uh, resource manager on top of it, which never really had any name. Um, it was basically just a monolithic thing. In, 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 in an HA architecture, you always have these two layers, a bottom layer for cluster communications and a top layer for cluster resource management. And in Heartbeat, those two layers did exist, but it was all packaged into one you know, monolithical glob. Um, yeah, right. And in, uh, in about, what was it, 2003 or something, um, IBM and then, then, then still independent Susan, uh, basically set out to uh, write something that was worthy of being named a cluster manager on Linux in the 21st century because Heartbeat had like, it was limited to two nodes, it didn't do any resource monitoring, it was uh, something like Sun Cluster blew it clean out of the water. Um, and, and that was, Andrew, that was pretty much what, you were, what your main task was when you, when you joined them. 
Um, and um, it got all, this, all these great new cluster resource management features like a policy engine and resource monitoring and extremely flexible configuration and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it was released, I think, in about 2007 or something like that. Um, except that people had kind of forgotten to provide a user interface other than um, an insanely arcane XML that was kind of unforgiving of typos. Yeah, no, Is that nice? So I promised one, the resources never eventuated to produce it. Yeah, OK, right, yes. Having XML snippets into a shell script um, repeat that, please. So, catting, catting XML snippets into a into a shell script is a great way to. Re this man is insane. Ignore him. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yes, but we all appreciate your irony, uh, and I totally agree. Um, and uh, and then there was another. Um, so, that was kind of a bad release decision, in my humble opinion. Um, but. Um, what the folks then decided, I think this was something that you primarily drove, Andrew, was um, we're, we're operating on this completely homegrown communications layer, and then there's something else that is actually standards driven. And why not go to that? And that was OpenAIS. Um, and because of that, and because of a certain amount, a li certain limited amount of infighting among the uh, uh, project community, um, Pacemaker was sort of spun off or, 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 uh, or taken out of the, of the, of the Heartbeat project. Oh, are you, are you I'm just, doing a little picture. Oh, you're drawing a family tree? Sort of. Yeah, great. Um, and, uh, and it became its own project, which also made sense in a, in a release schedule way, because Pacemaker was getting new features every week, and the communication layer was very stable. Um, and then... Uh, and Chorusing basically grew out of OpenAIS. So it's like it's a completely different code base compared to the Heartbeat um, communications layer. Okay? Um, so that was the long version. Um, the, the TLDR Facebook style is it's complicated. Um, but there is there is no real relationship between Heartbeat, which is now exclusively a cluster messaging layer and Corosync, which is also a cluster messaging layer, and, and, and Pacemaker, which is, which is and has always been a cluster resource manager, which used to be part of Heartbeat, is its own separate project and has been since 2008. So it has been for a while. So will it work with, with both? Or um, the question was, will it work with both? So as of today, Pacemaker supports both messaging layers. Uh, both Heartbeat and Corosync. The Pacemaker MCP is only supported on Corosync. On Heartbeat, it's basically the uh, pacemaker um, is always, uh, the pacemaker process are always children of the master Heartbeat process, but it also doesn't have those locking issues. Yeah, we never had the locking issues, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. Um, so as of today, both are supported, but it is commonly understood that Heartbeat support will eventually go away at some point in the future. But w when that point's going to be is kind of undetermined at this point. At, at the point that we have a killer feature that we can only uh, ride on Corsing, support on Corsync, then maybe up it goes away. But we haven't had such a feature yet. Right. So, um, one more question? Yeah. Um, I get, um, when I do Corsync config tool dash yes, I get uh, ring one ID active with no faults, but ring zero I get uh, faulty administrative intervention required and with a typo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well. In, well, that is a telltale sign of fix your network communications. So um, you told me earlier you were working basically on your own iron. Uh, so that clearly means that over that specific ring that it's complaining about, um, you've got a network issue. Yeah, and no. the troublesome part, this is what I mentioned earlier, the troublesome part with Corsync releases prior to 1.4 is even if you now replug the network, you would still have to intervene administratively um, <laughs> to fix it. And uh, in Corsync 1.4.0 plus, that's thankfully now fixed. And it was actually a SUSE guy that fixed it. It was um, uh, Zhao Zhu Yang, um, one of my colleagues from the Beijing office, yep. and, um, did the major part of the work on that. Right. OK. So we've got a working and replicating DRBD. We have uh, a working and communicating Corsync cluster. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start the pacemaker demons. And we just do that with service. I don't know if it's actually service pacemaker no. or pacemaker D on, on Debian. Pacemaker. 
end up a demon and you're an inscript with the same name. Ah, yep, see you everyone now. CRM one? Yeah, um, and we have a, a nice little nifty handy utility called CRM one, which we can use to monitor the cluster status. Um, we will take a few seconds here for the uh, DC election to occur, but that's done now. So um, the cluster is now fully fired up. Uh, we know not only have a uh, chorusing daemon running here, but it's also properly interfacing with, uh, with Pacemaker. And what we see from CRM on here is we now have both nodes online. That is to say they have properly checked into the cluster. We have also elected what we call a designated coordinator or DC. That's the guy that basically calls the shots on what's going to happen next in the cluster. That does not mean, however, that we can only manage the cluster from that node. We can manage it from any node. Uh, but when we make changes, it's basically the change goes to the DC and the DC broadcasts it out to uh, the other cluster nodes. The uh, DC is automatically re-elected when that node leaves the cluster. So it's nothing that we need to um, influence at any point. Andrew, is there a way to force a specific node to be a DC? No. There really isn't, is there? The okay. only reason we even tell you is because that's where the logs are probably more interesting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for the recording, Andrew was saying the only reason that we're actually telling you is because that's where the logs are the most interesting, uh, specifically because um, that's where we can do an excellent analysis. If, if, if anything goes wrong in, um, in, the, in the pacemaker policy engine, that's where all the input files uh, will be. And uh, where we can do an excellent, what was it? Selena said don't use post-mortem uh, review or, or whatever. Yeah, anyhow. Um, no, so if something uh, turns to shreds in pacemaker, the DC is where we basically start looking for the policy engine input files and things. Um, what arguments did you pass to CRM Mon? Oh. What uh, the arf. question was, what arguments did we pass to CRM Mon? Uh, it's ARF. Andrew, can you please implement a dash B option? I just want to do... <laughs> 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 um, so what's that do? So what does that do? CRM Mon uh, just gives us a basic idea of what the cluster is doing at this point. Um, it comes with a number, uh, it's, a, um, it's an in-curses, event-driven type of uh, uh, client that talks to the cluster infrastructure and it comes with a boatload of command line options. In the absence of a B, ARF is my preference. Uh, so what does that do? Uh, dash R shows us all of our resources that we have configured, not only the running ones. Um, uh, dash F shows us uh, a fail count, that is to say how often has this real resource failed on this box and dash capital A shows us cluster attributes which is also something that is usually quite helpful. Although that doesn't really do anything to our output at this point because we have defined neither resources nor cluster attributes. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing is that both of our nodes are online, uh, we have an elected DC and we are essentially good to go. Now. For those of you who worked or tried to work with Heartbeat 2 at the time and ran away screaming because they were uh, confronted with an XML-based interface, we have something much prettier and much more useful now, and it's called the CRM shell. Um, and it just goes by CRM, you know, people were amazingly creative with the naming here. And what it is, it's a text-based, menu-driven, self-documenting, interactive cluster management interface. Those were a lot of buzzwords, but they're all actually included in that. So it's really, really nice. Um, we have an online help, that is to say in every level of the CRM shell, we can just type help and we'll get an overview of what are the supported commands. We have nice little handy stuff like tap completion. Um, we have um, the ability to script uh, the CRM shell completely, so we can use uh, configuration snippets that we can just import and use. And that is exactly what we're going to do right now. Uh, we're going to show you just a wee little bit of the functionality of the CRM shell. It's really an extraordinarily powerful interface. There's a lot of things that we can do with it, such as interrogate a resource or a node status. We can literally take a snapshot of the current cluster configuration, take a copy of that, operate on that copy, make tons of changes, and then only when we're done, re-import that into the cluster configuration. There's a boatload of things that we can do with this. And we're only going to show you, uh, you know, quite a f just a few of these. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, change into the configure submenu, which when you open the CRM shell, you get by just entering the command configure, or the shell being fully scriptable. You can also just call the shell with the command CRM configure, and it will put you right into this submenu. 
And what we can do now is we could either configure the cluster from scratch here, or, um, and this is, we, we've, we're, we're, we're playing celebrity chef here a little bit, so we've, uh, we've produced a bit of a mise en place for you. Uh, so we have these little configuration snippets, all of which live in uh, slash root uh, with the extension .crm, and we're gonna load those uh, bit by bit uh, to add our uh, necessary resources to the configuration. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to load uh, one file that is properties.crm. So in the CRM configure uh, submenu, we can just do load and then either a full path uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, load update because we don't want to replace the SIP configuration. We, we just want to import the new stuff and update the SIP with that. Um, and then the actual file name of the configuration snippet that we want to import. If that is a uh, full path, an absolute path, then it's just going to take that. Uh, if it's a relative path name or a file name, then it's just, just going to evaluate that based on the current working directory, which is where we are right now. Okay? So load update properties.crm, and then we can do show. And lo and behold, we get stuff like syntax highlighting. Uh, so we can actually you know, sort of visually navigate around this. So what have we added here? Um, these things here, a DC version cluster infrastructure, expected quorum votes, is something that we cannot influence. That's something that just is being reported to us uh, from the cluster. What did we add? Two things. One of these you should actually use in production. The other, if you use in production and I catch you, I'm going to slap you. Um, so no quorum policy means, uh, no quorum policy equals ignore means even if you're losing quorum in the cluster, um, still continue to run resources, which is what we have to do in any two node cluster, failing which, if we, know, if we lose one of the nodes, there's only one left, that one node is not, does not form a core 8 cluster, therefore it doesn't do anything for us anymore. Um, if we set no quorum policy to ignore, which is what we do by, uh, which we basically always do in a, um, in a two node cluster, that means we can always lose one node and stuff is just going to continue working on the other node. And Stonith enabled, so Stonith, for those who don't know, is an acronym that stands for shoot the other node in the head. That is the um, uh, Linux HA slash pacemaker term for node fencing. And um, it is a vital um, stability and security feature uh, to have node fencing enabled in your cluster. We're only disabling it for testing purposes. Uh, and it's fine if you do this in a testing environment, but just don't go to production with it. Why is it necessary? Several reasons. One, if you're using shared storage and you have one node that is uh, potentially still accessing that storage, there's only one secure or safe way to remove that node from, from that storage, and that is to essentially kill it, um, or at least kill it and then bring it back up from the dead. Um, so that's one. Even if you're not using shared storage, you still need Stonith because uh, we have to evict nodes from the cluster where resources do not stop properly. Um, because for the same reason, it might still have access to cluster resources. It might do uh, things that it's not supposed to do. So if, any t if at any time we're trying to shut down a resource and that shutdown fails, it's just, it's just the shutdown operation, then we have to evict the node from the cluster. Hence, always use Stonith enabled equals true in production. And there's, there's various Stonith devices um, that you can use. You can use um, uh, Ethernet PDU things, you can use um, ILO devices, IPMI. Um, yeah, IPMI yeah. being the most common at this, at this stage, I would say, because it's pretty much un impossible to buy a server these days that doesn't come with an IPMI BMC with, uh, IPMI BMC with a LAN plus interface that you can connect to over the, over the wire. Okay, um, so we've, uh, so th what the uh, load update properties.crm did for us, it set these two properties, no quorum policy equals ignore, the science enable equals false. Um, what's nice about the CRM shell, we've imported the stuff, we've had it shown back to us, but for in, in order for it to actually become active, we actually need to commit this. If we don't commit it, then it just gets, that update gets thrown away. That update at this point doesn't do anything for us. We now actually have to add resources. Okay, like I said, what's a resource? Um, anything that the cluster manages. We have very, very simple resources such as uh, IP addresses, which are simply brought up and brought down on nodes as needed. We've got file systems, meaning we're, we mount this here, we mount this there. there. Uh, but because this is LCA and you're a smart crowd, uh, we're not gonna 
we're not going to occupy ourselves with something that simple. Uh, we're just going to dive headfirst into master-slave sets. Master-slave sets are an extended type of resource that is unique to Pacemaker. Um, and I, it's such a useful feature that I fail to understand why any of the um, non-open source competitors haven't implemented it yet. Uh, master-slave sets are a special variant of what Pacemaker calls clones. Clones themselves also being exceedingly useful. Define a resource once and then just tell the cluster how often do you want it? How many instances of it do you want in the cluster? And Pacemaker will do that for you. As in, uh, we can use clones to manage an entire IP range. As in, um, I want um, five IP addresses started, starting with one, two, three, four. Uh, and we just define this clone resource once and we're telling uh, Pacemaker, okay, I want five instances of this and it will make sure that we get the full uh, range from 1234 to 1239 in um, the cluster, which is really, really nice. Um, and master slave sets are basically clones that aren't equal, but clones where one of the nodes is sort of the higher up. Okay, dictator for life. Well, not for life, but dictator for as long as Pacemaker decides. Dictator till failover. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, and we have, uh, and that's what we use for managing DOBD resources under Pacemaker. Because there's two things that Pacemaker has to do. It has to bring up the DOBD resources on both of the, node, both of the nodes. This is what we did earlier with the DOBD atom up command manually. It has to do that uh, whenever it needs to interact with the, uh, with the DOBD resource. Uh, but it also has to select one master node and that master node then becomes the DOBD primary. Also something that we did manually earlier. But this is of course something that we want to automate in cluster management. So what we're now going to load update is our DOBD.CRM. And uh, the warnings here are a little bit excessive. We can safely ignore them for now. And this is a little more complex now. So what have we defined? We have what uh, Pacemaker calls a primitive. That's just a, a regular resource um, for our DOBD. It has an identifier, a name. We call it PDRB MySQL. Um, it has a, what we call a resource agent. Or you could also, um, you can also call it a service agent or a resource type, what have you. In Pacemaker parlance, it's called a resource agent. Um, these have a class, a provider, and a name. Um, in this case, it's the class OCF. Um, the provider was uh, named Linbit by the DOBD authors, and DOBD is just the, uh, is just the name of the, uh, of the resource agent. Um, in case you're wondering about this provider thing, that basically maps to a hierarchy in user lib OCF resource.d and then we have one directory per provider, uh, which is a nice way for third parties to just uh, package and ship uh, pacemaker integration resource agents. Um, we need to name the, uh, the DOBD resource, which is MySQL in our case, and we also let it monitor uh, this resource in specified intervals. And uh, we then wrap this primitive into one master-slave set. Okay? Um, the intricacies of which are not necessarily something that you need to worry about right now. What's important is uh, we want two instances of this thing. Remember, uh, master-slave set is basically um, a subtype of a clone. So we can uh, define, okay, I want two clone instances here. Only one of them can ever become a master. And the notify thing is a nifty little pacemaker feature where individual instances of clones can notify each other of, okay, this is what I'm doing right now. Um, this also is something that I think is completely absent from other cluster resource managers. So another very, very nifty pacemaker feature. And when we commit that, now something is actually going to happen in our CRM mon output. There we go. Ah, that was quick. So we brought the DOBD up on both of the nodes and we, uh, and Pacemaker selected one of the nodes, in this case arbitrarily because the promotion scores were identical. Um, and uh, it just made that thing the DOBD primary or in Pacemaker parlance the master on our node named Alice. And that is something that we can easily verify just as we did earlier. Uh, we can do a cat proc DOBD on Alice and we shall see its primary and everything is as expected. Okay. So now that we have that, uh, we are going to add the file system that we have created on this DOBD resource to our pacemaker management. Okay. Um, and for that, again, we have a load update fs.crm. 
Okay, and we want to show that as well. Um, and here's something that um, is one of the most powerful pacemaker features, but also one of the most challenging to basically wrap your head around. Um, this up here is relatively straightforward. That's just a primitive uh, resource, a simple resource. It just manages the file system. It has a few configuration parameters. We have to uh, tell the cluster, okay, uh, this is the device that you're going to mount. This is the mount point that you're going to mount it to. We're just going to use the standard default MySQL data derivative <coughs> MySQL. And uh, we also have to tell it the file system type. In case you're wondering why that is the case, uh, we have a little bit of um, don't, your, don't shoot yourself in the foot type magic in here. If you were to clone this thing, then we would check whether um, it's actually a clonable file system, like GFS or OCFS2, uh, or Gluster, or Luster, or what have you. Um, and we're also monitoring this thing every 20 seconds. So every 20 seconds, we check whether that mount point, mount point is actually still there. We have little, a little more intricate monitoring as well, we, we, which we could optionally turn on, um, such as, OK, try to actually write something to this file system every 20 seconds, to, just to see whether it's in fact not just mounted, but it's actually writable. Um, so that's the simple part. Uh, the slightly more complicated part is this. We, call this. we collectively call this constraints. We have two constraints constraint types here, a collocation and an order constraint. The collocation constraint, which is at the top here, means run this resource, this one, the, the file system that is, on whichever node currently has that resource, that's the DVD master slave set, in the master role. In other words, mount that file system only where the DVD is primary, in this case. Okay? Um, and that just implies do that on the same node. And the order constraint, lo and behold, specifies an order. That is to say, first promote the, uh, the DBD master slave set to the primary role or to the master role in, uh, in pacemaker parlance, and then start up the MySQL file system. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the file system that's going to host our MySQL data. Okay, now when we commit that, we're going to see some more magic happening in our CRM on, and um, luckily, uh, well not luckily, but quite intentionally, uh, the file system has now been started on the same node that already has the DVD device in the primary role, or in pacemaker parlance, the DVD master slave set in the master role. Again, something that we can easily verify by a simple mount on Alice. So look at that. Okay, it's all there. And now before we actually um, enable this thing as a MySQL, um, a highly available MySQL cluster, what we of course have to do is we actually have to initialize the MySQL database, which we do with MySQL install DB. And yeah, you can do that, but that's actually the default data dir. So we're already mounted where we're supposed to be. So yep, there you go. And it will now just install the MySQL system tables into varlib MySQL, which previously was an empty file system, empty mount point. Okay? Now, um, we can take a good, do a quick ls in, in, in varlib MySQL. Okay, and it's just the MySQL directory in there and in that, that's the, the MySQL default database that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Okay? Um, and now, we're just going to add everything else that we need for, uh, for a MySQL cluster to this Thing. And here again, we have a, a, a pre-made MySQL.CRM thingy. And there's a few things that have happened here. Uh, we do a show again here real quick. So uh, firstly, we have now added an IP address, that a uh, cluster IP address that MySQL combined to uh, with the PIP MySQL uh, resource. And we have also added an actual MySQL resource that monitors the MySQL daemon. Okay. May I ask a question here? I've asked you this in IRC, but I think you may have missed it. Um, is there a way to specify which specific interface that IP address? I know there's lots of smarts yeah. that tries to figure out yeah. which interface is going to go on. So the question was, is there, is there a way to explicitly specify which interface this thing is meant to be listening on? Yes, of course. There is a NIC parameter for the IP adder 2. Um, Can it be different for each host? Like it might be NIC 1, ETH 0 on one host, ETH 4. No, because the SIP is always cluster-wide, but 
If you, if you do that, um, and assuming that you already have a node IP address on that interface, uh, FindIF will do the right thing for you and therefore bind to S0 here and S1 there, if that's, that's what the right. configuration is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so we've added these two things and we've now tossed all of that into what in Pace we call the resource group, okay? Uh, resource group, we basically put everything into one group that, um, that MySQL requires. It needs its data directory, therefore it needs its file system, it needs its IP address and the MySQL daemon itself. And this is something that's really, really cool about the CRM shell. Uh, note that we had created these collocation and order constraints earlier, and they apply directly to the file system resource. Now I'm tossing that file system resource into a group, and the uh, referencing constraints are getting properly updated by the shell, which is nice. You know, it's just one less way of shooting yourself in the foot. It's just, uh, it's just a helpful, um, uh, a helpful little shortcut. Do we have a question? <laughs> Okay, where do we tell it to mount the file system before starting MySQL? Groups, groups by default are ordered and co-located. That is actually something that you can t turn off. Um, don't do that. Don't uh, do that. Just don't do that. Quoting, group. quoting, quoting, <laughs> quoting Andrew from, mem from memory, uncolocated groups are, I think, an abomination was the uh, term that yeah, used. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, yeah, you might have even used less uncertain terms. Um, uh, so yeah, so by default, uh, the groups are being started in this order and stopped in reverse order. It, okay, it's, so it, it's basically a shortcut for for order and co-location constraints. Yeah, anything in a anything in a group um, is always ordered together and co-located together. So you could you could write that group statement with location constraints if you wanted to, but there'd be like six of them. Or, yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, Okay, and, uh, and, uh, and, and they're now updated and everything, so we can commit this. And our initial MySQL startup always takes a little bit longer because it, of course, creates the InnoDB data files, etc. Uh, timeouts on start and stop, by the way, are, of course, configurable. Um, and we have done so in the example configuration that you are getting. Uh, why is this important? Pacemaker actually enforces timeouts. So in other words, if your resource does not, oh, what was that? That was a problem. Yeah, one of your boxes just went offline. How that happened? You did what? I didn't fancy. This is why we have these t-shirts, actually. Yeah. This is what your hardware should look like. Yeah. <coughs> so that you're reasonably highly available most of the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, look. They, yeah. they purport um, to be online wonderful. again. Look at that. You know, we've recovered. Hey, you know, it's an HA cluster. It's supposed to do this thing. Um, <laughs> So what we just showed you is failover. Huh? It wasn't planned at this point, but it just shows you that this thing is working. Um, so, um, no, what I meant to say actually earlier is uh, Pacemaker does enforce timeouts. Uh, so if your resource fails to start up or shut down in uh, the appropriate time, uh, Pacemaker will register that and uh, initiate failover as needed or um, try to restart, initiate failover, whatever is configured. Um, and the um, and specifically for something like databases, that is something that you want to take into consideration. Databases are not exactly <laughs> applications that are known to shut down mm. fast. Okay, mm. so the shutdown time that it takes for an orderly shutdown of your database is something that you definitely want to take into account and uh, want to uh, take into consideration mm. in your pacemaker config. You're better off setting timeouts that are too long than yeah. are too short, basically. Um, uh, Lars Murawski Bree had a good blog post about that somewhere. Oh, that was his uh, least worst case thing. Yeah. yeah. I think you only need to Google for least worst case, and that's probably it. Okay. So we have a working and running cluster. Let's go to lunch. No, not quite. Uh, not yet. Um, so uh, what have we set up here now as of this point? 
we have a working uh, HA cluster that will survive node failure. If you kill one of these nodes now, um, and you can do so by simply you know, using your, your libvirt interface, whatever you prefer, um, and kill one of these nodes, it's going to fail over to, uh, to the other node. However, it doesn't only do that, but it also does resource monitoring, which very often is um, even more useful because individual resources tend to fail more often than whole nodes. Okay? So let's give that a quick shot here. Um, if we open uh, our terminal on our node Bob, and we do a simple, um, a simple PS, there we go. Yeah, whatever you prefer. Okay, so uh, we've got our uh, MySQL daemon here. And uh, the, what is do pit file equals var? Well, anyhow, uh, let's not worry about um, that right now. Okay. It's good trunk Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't scare me. Uh, so it's doing exactly what we configured it to do. So not only is it running um, with the appropriate configuration, etc., but it's also binding to that specific cluster IP address that we have uh, that we've just configured. Can I get another CRM configure show real quick? Okay. And uh, where's our MySQL? Oh, up here. Uh, we have configured uh, resource monitoring for this thing, okay? So um, if you could just get a, a CRM mon um, RF or something on Alice, yes, okay, we already have that, great. Um, and now what we can do is we can just uh, uh, cut over to, what is it, Bob? And um, just do a quick, you know, whatever. Let's send MySQL. Uh, Monty is going to cringe at this, but we're just going to set my send MySQL a term signal. And the term is actually fine. Killing it is really evil. You should always be able to just kill your MySQL if you're running on top of uh, HA setup because your power might just go out. Yes, so of course. Fragile yes, through. but um, I'm going to go into that in just a little bit. Okay. There's one additional consideration that you want to make in your HA setups. But uh, okay, let's just kill that puppy. And then cut over to the other box here. <laughs> that's, that's a clean shutdown, by the way. Yeah, but still, it's something that Pacemaker has to detect as a resource failure and recover from it as it's doing right now. Yeah. Okay, So it brought the resource back up. And um, this is why I always use this um, CRM mon-f flag. It not only tells us when a resource is stopped, it also tells us when it's running because it's successfully recovered and has a fail count. So it actually tells us how often has this resource failed uh, on this node. And we can do nice little tricks like um, let this, uh, res if that resource fails on one node like more than five times, don't bother recovering it in place anymore, fail over instead to the other node because we're suspecting that we're having our hardware problem. Um, and it's very, very configurable. We can do all sorts of things with this. Um, and uh, there's a number of, of there's a really a lot of really, really cool stuff that we can do with this. So um, when you have this, you know, do have fun with it and break it. OK? Uh, when you have this, you can, you can kill one of your nodes uh, and watch it fail over. You can bring that node back up. Um, the um, you can uh, kill one of your resources. You can do stuff like, for example, removing the IP address. And then you'll notice that because the IP address is being recovered, there's also that one dependent service on it, namely MySQL, that's being recovered. Because that doesn't, that's not too happy with no longer having its IP address that it's bound to. Um, I'm do this yeah, again. there we go. My brain's going blank. What IP address is it? Here, that's the secondary one. That one. The 110? 110. There you go. Is that going to work? There you go. And that's failed now, and now we need to cleanly shut down MySQL and bring everything back up. So that's, you know, it, it enforces these, these dependencies uh, nicely. Um, I might just. Um, if you can still see that, the. You can see the two resources that we've failed. I killed MySQL twice before, so its fail count is two. And we killed the IP address once. 
So its fail count is one. Um, when it went down and was restarted, uh, MySQL was cleanly stopped and yep. started by Pacemaker. So it itself doesn't have another fail count because it, it wasn't the dead thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that, I've wanna, that I just want to mention because I think it's really, really important for everyone to keep that in the back of their heads when you're um, operating an HA cluster. Um, so as Monty was saying earlier, in an HA cluster, it's perfectly acceptable to like kill, um, or, like kill dash nine, uh, uh, something like a MySQL server. Because after all, when we lose power or when we have some catastrophic problem on that box, we don't ask MySQL to shut down cleanly either. So that is something that we have to recover from. And that is something that's perfectly doable. Um, if you are not insane enough to put your production database on a non-transaction capable database engine, like my ISAM. Don't uh, run anything on my ISAM, it's stupid. Uh, okay, <laughs> anyhow, yeah, um, true. But oh well. Um, so, uh, this is really, really important. If you have an application that is inherently not crash safe, then Pacemaker, Chorusing, DRBD, what have you, are not gonna make it any more crash safe. It's just not capable of doing that. If conversely, you have an application that is crash safe, if you configure pacemaker chorusing DOBD correctly, um, there is no way that's gonna get any less crash safe. Okay, so that's one thing that's really, really important. And the other thing is, and this is, very, this is specific to InnoDB, but it, the same concept applies to a number of other um, uh, uh, demons and services and what have you, and that is, uh, when you are optimizing something like a database for performance, what you typically do is you follow a pattern of write to disk as late and as rarely as possible. And uh, any da database worth its salt, even when you're, uh, when you're buffering a lot, when you're caching a lot, when you're, uh, when you're keeping lots of stuff in memory for a long, long time, and then, um, and then actually write to disk at the latest possible opportunity, uh, they will recover from this, but they will not make any guarantees for how long that's gonna take. Okay, and if you've got if you uh, if you've got say a 96 gigabyte uh, RAM server, and you're following this rule that you or this suggestion that you find in many places of um, use an InnoDB buffer pool that's 80% of your RAM, and you've got a really really busy database that's being hammered a lot, that is a lot of you know dirty stuff that you have in your database that you then need to recover to a consistent state from, and that can take a long long time, um, and even, it might take such a long time that you're breaking your SLAs. Um, at which point, people are not gonna be happy about you running an HA cluster when it takes you hours or days to recover that critical service that you're running. So this is something that you just wanna keep in the back of your head. Um, certain rules for performance optimizations are rules that you have to reevaluate when you're running into an HA cluster because downtime is bad. Downtime is a lot worse than having, you know, reduce performance for a certain time or even permanently. So that's another thing that you just want to uh, keep in mind. Before we go to questions, because we only have five minutes left, and I don't want to stand between you and your lunch for too long, uh, we have a cluster HA and storage replication boff this afternoon, right after lunch. So if you haven't had enough of your HA fix as of now, join us after lunch. We're going to be in studio two which is both, all the three studio rooms are to the left of the Caro Theater. So where you went for keynotes this morning, if you haven't been to a studio before, it's like you walk to the main, before you walk into the main keynote lecture theater entrance, you make a left and a right, and this, there's the studios, they're all clearly mar marked. We're gonna be in studio number two as of 1320 uh, this afternoon. Andrew's gonna join us, everyone else is certainly welcome, uh, bring your, coffee or whatever you'd like to bring with you. Uh, grill us with questions. Um, tell us we're stupid. Um, tell us we need to fix things. Whatever it is, we're always uh, happy to get you know, direct feedback from people who use this stuff and who know what they're doing, and LCA is a perfect crowd for that. Um, so please consider, consider yourself invited to that, and now we'll be happy to take any remaining questions. Oh wow, did we just steamroll over you? Ours is broken. So. <laughs> well, that's the question. Ours, ours didn't come up. Oh, yours didn't come up. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, uh, we can. Me, I can try to rephrase that. <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any suggestions on, on debugging uh, resources that won't start and, and why? 
Oh, look, Andrew, we're talking about logging now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, the, the whole stack has a reputation, a completely undeserved reputation for having verbose logging. Okay? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so the um, so no the, the 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 thing is that in in uh, in many standard configurations, uh, pacemaker and related services are just completely flo uh, flooding the logs. Therefore, my knee-jerk answer of look at your logs and they will tell you is not going to help you too much. Um, but uh, specifically, um, do you know which resource it is that isn't coming up? Yes. Yes. Okay. In and that you know case. Uh, you can just grab for that specific um, uh, resource agent name in the syslogs because everything that, that's actually being logged that comes from a resource agent is prefixed with the resource agent name. So that would be if, it's, if your IP address is not coming up, that would be IP address 2, etc. But and you want to look at that on, in the logs on the node that the IP address failed on. Yeah, correct. But I will be more than happy to spend some time with you going through this and debugging this and troubleshooting this because, after all, that's what we're here for. There we go. See? Yeah. Okay, I've got a different interesting problem. I noticed, um, as I said, I'm doing this on production hardware and um, we're using Debian Squeeze, mm -hmm. which is using, um, by default, uh, Pacemaker 1.09 and Corusync uh, 1.2 or the other way around. So I uh, realized I need to be using backports. So I went to the backports version, which gives me the same version you have here, which is much better. And in the process, when I um, did that on one of the nodes, I just did an upgrade. On the other node, I actually ended up, because of problems with the packages, I ended up uninstalling Corusync and Pacemaker and reinstalling them. And now I have no CIB, and the CRM tool just won't connect and won't let me load the CIB <laughs> back in from the other node. So I guess the question is more related to, okay, what do we do on uninstall and upgrade and whatnot? What can we do with individual nodes um, that will or will not break the cluster? Generally speaking, if you are uninstalling uh, Pacemaker and reinstalling it or doing an upgrade or what have you, um, when you fire the services back up, and I presume you have, when you fire the services back up, it's going to check back into the cluster, the, the communication rings, and um, the, uh, the SIP itself, the cluster information base, the internal representation of the cluster configuration and status is versioned. So um, it will uh, basically recover its copy f uh, of the SIP from disk when it comes up, and then it's going to realize, oh, wait, we have something much newer on the wire, and just going to um, use that. Okay, so generally speaking, um, if you uninstall Pacemaker and uh, put it back up and uninstall, reinstall, and then restart the daemons, it should just rejoin the cluster. And that's what it typically normally does. And if it's not doing that for you, again, something that we can do in, 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 the, in the BOF. If the BOF turns into a hands-on hackathon, that's perfectly fine by me. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention, an exceedingly useful feature in Pacemaker, and this is something that people that come from Solaris clusters uh, seem to really, really love, is <coughs> maintenance mode. In maintenance mode, we're telling Pacemaker, um, keep your hands off of all resources. That is to say, it's not doing any monitoring anymore, it doesn't do any recovery, it doesn't do any what have you. But I can now literally rip the guts out from the entire cluster infrastructure. So I can shut down the pacemaker services, I can shut down Corusync, I can upgrade the binaries, I can bring them back up, etc., etc., and my services are going to continue to keep running. So in this case, you would be able to, like, for example, um, you put uh, this cluster in maintenance mode, your MySQL continues to run, you have your virtual IP address, etc., etc., and now you shut down Corusync and you completely upgrade it with a new version and you bring it back up. You can even do a live, no downtime migration from Heartbeat to Corusync if you want to. So you put the cluster in maintenance mode, you shut down your Heartbeat processes, you bring up your Corusync configuration, fire up Corusync, and uh, then uh, take the cluster back out of maintenance mode, and boom, you know, you're done. And that's really, really um, helpful. So yeah, CRM configure property maintenance mode equals true. Poof, cluster is in maintenance mode. All the resources are unmanaged, etc. And where is that bot? 
The studio. buff? Where, where's the buff yeah, The buff is going to be in Studio 2, which is over in the same building as the, as the keynote um, theatre. Just a short comment. Just make sure that Sarah and Mod is happy that all of it redetected all the resources running before you turn that. Yeah. Uh, yes. So Andrew was saying uh, check Sarah and to make sure that everything is actually working as, uh, as expected. Uh, when, we when we come out of, uh, of maintenance mode, Pacemaker does what we call a reprobe. So it basically checks all of the all the resources for their for the current status, and if a resource should have failed in the meantime, then it recovers that again. So I've just um, put it in a maintenance mode, yeah. and I've stopped pacemaker on Bob. CRM on on Alice is not aware of what's going on. Yeah, that's fine. That's what you want. Um, Yeah, uh, sure. but yeah. still, the service itself, which is MySQL, which is what we normally care about, is uh, is still running. Pacemaker services aren't chorusing isn't at this point. Oh, you just stopped oh, the pacemaker. Okay, never mind. Pacemaker, yeah, yeah, that's, fine, that's fine. You know, just it's enough. Um, and if I start that up again, um, now it knows about the state that all those resources are in, and now I can safely take maintenance mode off. There you go. And that's an, that's an example of just running the, not using the interactive mode of the shell too. You can just clicky clicky, boom, done. <coughs> All right. Sorry, we have to, you know, I just pushed the GitHub there. Name changes. Uh, so you fixed your broken yes. node names in IPBX. Yes, yes, thank you. There's one convert. <laughs> Woo. OK. Um, I think that's just about it, uh, time-wise, and like I said, we don't want to be between you and your lunch. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We hope to see many of you in the BOF. Again, that would be at 1320 uh, in room Studio 2. Thank you very much.